Okay, we are recording. <laughs> Thanks everyone for your patience. Um, certainly been a learning curve to figure out all of these remote technologies. Um, but welcome to session five of our 2020 virtual community forest forum. Uh, the topic at the top of the hour here is getting to scale. Um, finance strategies and operating models. So uh, we have three panelists who are going to cover a variety of different topics. We're going to start um, actually in reverse order from what's on your printed agenda. We're going to start with, um, boy, I can't get my computer to not be in full screen mode. Sorry. Uh, we're going to start with um, Ben Donatelli from Washington Recreation and Conservation Office, and he will be uh, going over the current program, which just ended its first round of RFPs, and um, talk about the program, the geographic distribution of um, applicants, and then um, also, sorry, the um, the upcoming milestones and decision points for that um, for that effort. Uh, then we'll have Ben Rothfuss Dare, Ben Dare Rothfuss from Sustainable Northwest, uh, talk to us a little bit about the Oregon Coast Community Forest Scoping Initiative that we have um, on our team and some of the pilot projects that he has been working on uh, and how they tie into state clean water revolving fund financing, uh, which gets us um, a little bit towards scale. And finally, Mark uh, Welther from the Redwood Community Forest Foundation will bring us home with about 30 minutes on his uh, incredible community forest in Northern California, a 50,000 acre property um, that he has been managing and uh, financing for many years. And I think some of the lessons learned will be um, really useful for the rest of our participants. So that's our plan. As Ben mentioned, if you have questions throughout the presentations, please do include them in the chat and we will get to them all at the end. I think we should have about 20 minutes for some discussion. And um, Please do stay muted with your cameras off during the presentations, just so we can focus on them. But I think that's it. I was gonna, I threatened to introduce our present presenters with some, um, you know, information about their favorite pastimes and pets, having no background on that. And the only uh, person who I could convince to give me some info ahead of time was was Ben Donatelli with his dog Milo, who I would love to show you if I can, but I don't think that I uh, can oversee over uh, overshare. Oh, wait, maybe now I can. This guy, look at this little dog in the um, epic snowstorm, 11 inches. Maybe, Ben, you can give a little more context to it. So I know that Ben Donatelli loves his dog Milo going for walks in Washington County or in Washington State. Um, I know that Ben, ben Dare Rothfuss is turning 32 today. Happy birthday, Ben. And that he loves um, paddle boarding and fishing. And Mark Welther, I don't know you that well, but I'm guessing that you also enjoy walking in the woods, and I think you may also be a birder. So that's how I will uh, leave it, and maybe uh, Ben Donatelli, I will stop sharing, and you can begin. Um, did we lose Ben? Thanks, Carola. I'm still here. I'm just trying to figure out how to share now. No problem. Uh, give me one second. Share. Okay. And if we turn it to that mode, can you all see my PowerPoint now? Yes, we are seeing the view where you um, the upcoming slides are still visible. You might want to put it in presenter mode. Oh, hmm. Perfect. How about now? Oh, there. Okay, I think there's a little dis delay, so it might switch back and then switch back again real quick. Great. Um, thank you, Kaola. Um, if if my presentation looks weird as I go, please let me know and I'll try to <laughs> figure that out on my end too. Um, but thank you for that great introduction. Um, thanks for the invitation to be here today. This uh, is a great forum and I'm really looking forward to hearing um, from the other presenters. Um, thank you all, this is exciting. Uh, so I wanted to talk for a little bit about uh, the, the Washington State Recreation Conservation Office um, 
our new community forests program, um, the process that we use to develop the program, um, and uh, a little bit about the process as it just wrapped up to solicit our first round of projects. Um, so uh, for those of you that, that are less than familiar with the Washington State Recreation and Conservation Office, um, a little bit of history on us. We are a very small uh, state agency. We are uh, kind of like the state's uh, um, bank for recreation, uh, outdoor recreation and conservation um, in Washington State. We administer uh, about 23 different grant programs um, that focus on outdoor recreation, salmon, reco salmon and orca recovery, uh, habitat conservation, working lands conservation, um, and we manage a capital budget of around 500 million every biennium. Um, but almost all of that is entirely passed through grants um, to communities, uh, nonprofit organizations, and uh, other state agencies throughout Washington State. Um, we've been around since uh, 1964. Uh, we just celebrated last year our 55th anniversary, so that's a huge milestone. And um, yeah, we really pride ourselves in being uh, open and transparent, and um, with our grant processes, and and really working uh, with others across the state to uh, develop and refine our grant programs to really best meet the needs of of the um, people that we try to serve. So. That's a little bit on us. Um, in 2000 and uh, early 2020, um, the, the legislature um, directed us, the state legislature directed us uh, as the Recreation and Conservation Office to develop a new community forest grant program. Um, they wanted us to work with a variety of stakeholders, including the Washington State Department of Natural Resources um, and uh, the advocates uh, for community forests across the state uh, to develop funding criteria, um, create a project list, um, develop accounting assurances for the projects that are funded. Um, and, and then they directed, they had a few high level sort of uh, requirements for uh, project eligibility. Uh, things like the projects must be considered forest land. Um, the, the, the projects must acquire uh, property, uh, fee simple acquisition of property. Um, and they, told, they directed uh, that local governments, tribes, nonprofits, and state agencies all be eligible uh, in the program. Um, so they provided us with this sort of skeleton framework uh, of the program. Um, and it was our job to put a little bit of meat on that bone. And um, so we gathered a, a good diverse community uh, uh, or advisory committee. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into who that was here in a second. Um, they put a pretty tight timeline on this. Uh, normally developing a new grant program for us runs about an 18 month process for developing the program and then getting it up and running and, um, and then soliciting the projects. Um, they gave us until December 31st of this year uh, to deliver them a ranked list of projects so that they consider, could consider those projects for funding in the next biennium. Um, so we compressed our time frame down into about um, three months or four months to really develop the program. Um, Kayla sat on the advisory committee and was a huge help um, in really crafting the program. Uh, so much appreciation to, to her for that. Um, so we have since uh, solicited the first round of projects um, and that I will share here, this is the advisory committee um, that helped us put together that uh, on the program guidelines. Um, you can see it's a pretty diverse group of folks from the land trust community, uh, local and county government folks, uh, tribal representatives, um, and then also a couple folks from the forest products industry. 
Um, so great, really knowledgeable community. It was fantastic to help have that that assistance in developing the program. Um, a few of the details, like I said, uh, the legislature required that it be considered forest land. So we did a little bit more work uh, as the advisory committee to kind of define what that means. Um, we decided to align primarily with the uh, United States Forest Services uh, Community Forest Program and their definition of forest land. Um, and so you can see that there. Um, five or more acres that are 75% or more forested. Um, and that was really just to ensure compatibility and that um, this program can be used uh, in concert with, with the Forest Services program. Um, uh, so uh, uh, using that as a source of match and, and other uh, collaborative efforts. Um, so as I mentioned, eligible applicants are city and county government agencies. Uh, special purpose districts like uh, port districts or departments of uh, or like municipal um, park and rec districts. Um, you know, there's these other sort of less than full city or county governmental jurisdictions. Um, tribal uh, nations are also eligible to apply. Uh, and then state agencies, uh, but there was part of the legislative direction that said state agencies have to be working directly with one of the above applicants. And so a state agency um, like the Department of Natural Resources or Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, they, they must have some sort of formalized agreement with one of these other agency or one of these other entities um, to be the sole applicant. Um, the grant funds can be used uh, primarily for property acquisition, fee simple. That was a requirement in the in the uh, legislative direction. Uh, but we also uh, provided an opportunity to use some of the grant funds for uh, restoration, whether it's forest health or watershed restoration uh, projects. Um, and then also for some level of recreation development. If, for example, there needs to be a trailhead built or a bridge, as you can see in the picture here, um, built somewhere on the property, a certain portion of the grant funds can be used um, for those activities as well. Um, and also, the, there is a requirement, uh, uh, there is a deliverable requirement for receiving the funding that as part of the project, uh, the, app, the sponsor must prepare a community forest management plan. We spent a lot of time with the advisory committee um, kind of going over what a community forest management plan for this program should include. Um, and so the, as a result, uh, grantees are allowed to use a certain portion of the grant funds in developing that management plan. Um, so some of the financials around this, uh, there's no minimum request. There is a $3 million maximum request. Um, and then there's a 15% uh, minimum match requirement. Um, and then this just shows the location of the projects that came in through our first application cycle, which just wrapped up October 1st. We accepted applications um, for about a month. Uh, and then very quickly turned those applications around and got them out to our review committee. The advisory committee also helped us review and score all the projects based on the criteria that we developed. Um, and so this just shows the location of all of those projects. Um, there were 15 total projects, um, six from government entities, nine from nonprofit organizations. Um, 14 of those projects were just acquiring land. One of those projects actually took advantage of that ability to use some of the funds for um, restoration. And they were doing some, they, were, they applied for some forest health uh, treatments. Um, largest project was 3,700 acres, uh, pretty good size. Um, and then the smallest project was 80 acres. Um, the average project size uh, was 757 acres. If we fund all of the projects on the list, that is going to be 11,000 acres of forest land that gets protected. 
um, the total mat or the total request budget for for all of the projects was 33 million with a 12 million dollar match. Um, that's that averages out to about 36 percent in match, which in our eyes with a 15 percent minimum is incredible. Uh, the fact that the um, the applicants doubled that minimum match requirement uh, more than doubled. Um, that's fantastic. Um, so I think that just really shows the support for for the organization or for these types of projects that, that is out there. Um, average request was 2.23 million. This is the list of projects as it was ranked um, by the advisory committee. Um, so pretty exciting to see see this uh, program kind of come full circle. Um, as our agency budget requests move forward, we did request 22 million uh, for this program. Uh, and so we'll see what the legislature uh, deliberates on and, and grants us for this program in, next spring. Um, hopefully we will know um, kind of around April what our budget looks like for this program. If, if they grant us the full 22 million, that would get us down to about hoquium here. Um, so we're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, but again, it's good from our point of view to have um, a little bit more uh, or a few more projects um, than, than we have a budget for. Uh, and hopefully that will encourage the legislature to give us a thumbs up to run, run this program again uh, next year. Uh, so these are just a few slides that I put together about Nason Ridge, which is the um, number one project. Um, but with that, I think I'll stop there and turn it over to Ben and others. And I think I have to stop sharing my screen, right? Perfect. Thanks so much. Yep. That was great. You're right on time. And um, we do have some questions coming in for you, but I think we'll just save them until the end if you're okay with that. Yeah, so that people... sounds good. Great. People, please continue putting them in the chat and we'll have Ben Dare Rothfuss take over. Hi folks, um, just a confirmation here. Uh, can you see my screen all right? I'm not seeing your screen. Let's try this again. We got it. There we go. Do we have a full screen slide now? Yes. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone. Um, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to work through the history of some of the work that we've done as a community forest coalition, the problem statement and uh, challenges to getting to scale that we've identified. And then finally, some work some examples of projects that we've been working on in the Oregon coast. Um, and a, a great debt of gratitude goes out to the uh, executive committee and leadership of the Northwest Community Forest Coalition uh, and the expertise of all the um, more senior natural resource uh, people whose brains I've had a chance to uh, share the knowledge of. So thank you so much. So first of all, that, you know, this session is titled Getting to Scale. What do we mean by scale? Well, uh, at the time when we were identifying barriers and challenges to getting to scale, and we were interviewing community forest practitioners, uh, th this is the range of the scales that we identified. Uh, back in 2017, the Mount Adams Resource Stewards Community Forests uh, was really only 400 acres. It's grown since then. Uh, and that's a testament to the work of Jay McLaughlin and others in the community. The Nisqually Land Trust also has grown in size uh, with a more recent acquisition to over uh, 2,000 acres. Uh, we toured that last year um, with the Community Forest Coalition, and you can still find pictures up on our website. Uh, finally, I interviewed uh, Tom Tuckman with U.S. Forest Capital, who was one of the architects and masterminds behind the USAL Forest acquisition that you'll hear uh, considerably more about uh, when I pass the microphone to Mark later in this presentation. 
So scale ranges in size from less than a million dollars and less than 500 acres to almost 50,000 acres and $65 million. Timberland is expensive. Timberland is expensive and public funding and philanthropic funding that's available to buy it is limited. Uh, the funding is complicated. The grants are complicated. The grant agreements are complicated. And then once you have land, uh, you really need to be doing an ongoing job of community engagement to find a balance between conservation and earning income from timber uh, to assure working benefits over the long term. Transacting land, especially at scale, is highly specialized uh, with its own set of lawyers and brokers. And finally, uh, achieving consensus, uh, getting to the point where you can say as a community, yes, we're going to vote a majority uh, to move forward with this large and complicated project also takes effort. Ben, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but your slides are a little bit large from my view window, at least. I can only see sort of three quarters of them. Thanks for that. I'll change one of my settings here. Hopefully it wasn't just a problem on my end. You never know. <laughs> Thanks. How does that look now? Um, I'm not seeing them again yet, but there may be just a little delay. Do other c -Benz slides? Uh, if you could chat yes or no, that would be great. No. Okay, people are not seeing your slides at the moment, Ben. Sorry. And we're back up. Yay, thank you. So getting to one of the primary challenges, um, timberland is expensive. Well, what goes into timberland value and timberland cost? Historically, that's been the value as a productive asset in producing uh, fiber and timber. One of the methods for appraising timberland is a discounted cash flow model where you look at the, all the future revenues and then you discount back and say, uh, for a rational manager and investor, what is the value today for putting in all this work, all these operations and effort, if I'm going to get um, such and such a payout at final harvest? And we're, we're finding that the discounted cash flow value of forest lands has started to diverge from land prices. It might have been at one point that with low interest financing or um, an investor that was willing to be patient, you could reasonably expect to buy timber land just for the, the payout of timber at the end of the rotation. That's starting to change. And is it because of changing development value, other market forces, others have speculated. Uh, one of the things that's certainly driving this change in land values is development value. And fragmentation is one of the things that we can agree all across the political spectrum is something we want to avoid. Uh, contiguous forest land is better for habitat, ecosystem services, and for working forests. So how can conservation compete? What are the value streams that we can bring in? What are the strategies and incentives? Watershed benefits are one such approach. In the 2018 Community Forest Forum, we heard from Bob McCain at the EPA Research Lab in Corvallis and the strategies that they're using to model the different value streams from community forests where you're balancing between forest products, uh, local dollars, uh, fish and watershed benefits and carbon stocks. 
the Clean Water Estate Revolving Fund Loan is one such financing mechanism that can help recognize the value of those additional benefits. And it does so in a couple of ways. Provides below market rate financing that is very patient and in terms of up to 30 years. That better matches the amount of time it takes trees to grow from young seedlings all the way up to pre-merchantable and merchantable age. The interest, current interest rate for loans of up to 30 years is less than a percent. And I just checked the 10-year treasury bill um, and that is up to 1.56% for 30-year T-bills. So this is way below even what uh, the Fed is projecting for inflation. In addition to that, there are benefits for uh, green infrastructure and green projects. Principal forgiveness is available for potentially up to $500,000. On the Oregon coast, we've had the pleasure of working with the Arch Cape Water District on the Arch Cape Forest. This is 1,500 acres adjacent to the North Coast Land Conservancy's Rainforest Reserve. This slide shows uh, the water intake just below the proposed community forest. The drinking water source area and the acquisition overlap. According to DEQ analysts, uh, the drinking water source area and the acquisition are 78% aligned. And that's what allows this project to be eligible. The strategy that we're working on for acquisition um, is to balance a forest service, forest legacy grant with um, multiple sources of financing and philanthropy where uh, we're, we're trying to match up um, forest service 75% financing with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund loan as match um, to get us across the threshold for acquisition. Uh, this is really important for a state like Oregon because we don't have a grant program uh, the same as Washington uh, for community forest acquisition. And this of course will be balanced by uh, ecological forestry on designated areas within the watershed and community forest. We've done some work to quantify the ecological and ecosystem benefits of this approach. My colleague, Dr. Shurjita Basu, uh, just recently found that in terms of runoff alone, um, maintaining forest structure would save uh, the sewer district at least $9,000 a year in operating costs compared to uh, a situation uh, with uh, less forest cover and more erosion and runoff. This all is part of a larger body of work um, and in trying to wrap this up within my time, I'll just uh, zip through this. Um, we have the fortune of working with many great experts, um, starting with a mapping initiative to map these watersheds and community forest opportunities in Oregon. Um, a brain trust at the 2019 uh, Land Trust Land Camp Workshop. Uh, and now moving forward, um, talking to Nick Norton and the Washington Association of Land Trusts on some very uh, technical and wonky issues like what counts as collateral for a state revolving fund loan? Can timber be considered collateral? What counts as risk? How do you underwrite a loan? Would the balance sheet of a nonprofit be an acceptable uh, applicant uh, in trying to make this source of financing available from our projects. And finally, um, doing outreach and building partnerships with those who were able to implement these projects on the ground, such as the Coalition of Oregon Land Trusts and those who work in the forest, the Oregon Farm Workers and Forest Workers Union uh, and the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians. So thank you. And with that, I will wrap up. Um, yes, there are quite a lot of slides here and I'm happy to provide these afterwards. Um, we're always available. You have our contact information and happy to debrief this further. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ben. I think you've got a few questions that we can return to at the end of Mark's presentation. Mark, if you wanna pull up your slides. 
We're excited to hear from you. I'm almost there. It's looking good. Come on. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you, Keola and uh, Ben, for inviting me to take part in this forum. Um, the um, I'm going to talk today about the Redwood Forest Foundation Incorporated and in, in our large project, which is still a work in progress, but it is um, it is quite an interesting project that's learned a lot of lessons in the um, uh, almost 14 years that we've had the property and our current property and uh, and I've been in this position for seven years. And by the way, Kale, I I'm a very amateur birder, but I am a sailor too. Um, first of all, what I'm going to cover today is the background of the Redwood Forest Foundation, the uh, acquisition of the 50,000 acre USAL Redwood Forest in Northern California in 2007, and the things that we've learned over the years, the things that we've done well, the things we, um, you know, where, where we've uh, learned some hard lessons. <clears throat> The uh, Redwood Forest Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation founded in 1997 by community leaders in Northern California. And it was a response to the California timber wars of the early 1990s. I know Oregon and Washington had their own version of this. And we'll talk a little bit about the timber wars uh, in a few minutes. <clears throat> the uh, organization created a vision of establishing working community-based forests that provide both critical habitat for increased biodiversity and improve regional economic vitality. So um, emphasis on depleted forests and also working, making them, keeping them in production as working community forests. And our mission is to acquire, protect and restore and manage forest lands uh, throughout the Redwood region. And uh, one of the most important parts of this is the acquire part. The founding board of directors was very clear that they wanted to acquire these properties and put the resources in the control of, of the local residents of the region. And of course, as many of you who are in community forestry um, know that we're, we're, uh, we work according to the triple bottom lines of ecology, economy, and equity. So those are, and when we say equity, we mean social equity. Uh, we, we talk about what is fair and um, uh, of value to the local communities. So a quick history of logging and environmentalism in Mendocino County, where our forest is located. Um, first of all, logging has happened continuously in the Mendocino Coast since the 1850s. <clears throat> I put in a couple of historic photos here. You can see some of the redwood. And we also have quite a large component of Douglas fir. This is a, a mill that was in uh, at Usall Beach, which is the uh, coastal part of our property around the turn of the 20th century. Of course, it's no longer there, but it, uh, this was a, the big mill at the time. And we also had, because the Highway 101 was not developed and uh, we weren't able to transport logs by highway, there was a pier built out into the ocean and the logs were taken um, by steamer to San Francisco and elsewhere. Uh, steam arrived in 1883 and uh, the steam donkeys and uh, rail systems helped uh, remove the logs more efficiently and faster. And we did have a railroad in the USAL forest. Uh, there's still some remnants there. In uh, 1906, the San Francisco earthquake increased the demand for redwood and Douglas fir dramatically. And uh, there was a big uptick in the uh, production of these forests. And then, of course, after World War II, the technological leap, leap uh, really made it uh, possible to log much faster and more efficiently. Here's one of the early uh, chainsaws and, uh, and also tractor logging, which continues today. And, um, you know, these are some of the results. I, I put this one in here just to show that uh, there were different 
efforts to protect the forests uh, over the years. In 1973, California instituted the forest practice rules, which among other things created different uh, silvicultural requirements. And uh, one of them was variable retention where they were required to retain certain uh, elements of the forest. But in other words, well, it, overall, um, you know, uh, there were, um, starting in 1973, California was uh, trying to protect the forest while still allowing um, aggressive um, logging. And this is, uh, I, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the old Georgia Pacific uh, mill in Fort Bragg, California, uh, which is where my office is. Uh, this mill closed in 2002. It was owned by Louisiana Pacific before that, and my office is kind of in the right corner of that. <clears throat> and then in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, the timber wars happened where uh, some of the, uh, the environmental movement was becoming more active in the area and starting to protest uh, some of the logging activities. And you, um, some of it started with Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which was, I believe, in the 1960s, and other um, books like The Monkey Wrench Gang by Edward Abbey. The, um, we do have northern spotted owls in Northern California in our uh, old growth forests, and as they do in Oregon and Washington. And, and of course, there were a number of protests. Uh, one of the most famous is uh, Julia Butterfly uh, tree sitting in Luna, the, one of the old growth redwoods in Northern California. And of course, industry had their own reaction. This is a counter demonstration in 1990 in Fort Bragg. <clears throat> so the Redwood Forest Foundation nonprofit was born of compromise in 1997 with the idea of turning the timber wars into something positive going forward. There were uh, over a million acres of lands that were in production as working for us and needed to be have some kind of a, a plan going forward, uh, triumph of dialogue and coalition building because it was uh, designed to bring together all the stakeholders in the uh, Northern California's forests and generate a broad consensus focusing on how to get local control of the resources and also build community wealth at the same time. Um, and of course, with a, with a conservation trajectory where the uh, harvest was below growth and uh, the stocks were increasing over time. So who do we consider to be our community? Of course, timber industry workers and the people who depend on the forest for their livelihood. Also local residents and business owners. And I should include um, as, as uh, Ben did, the uh, lawyers and accountants and uh, other business owners academics, agencies, public officials, including uh, regulators, and just uh, people throughout the uh, California and across the country and, and even in other parts of the world who recognize the, the beauty and importance of redwoods and value them. So our first acquisition happened in 2007. We had the opportunity, so the organization had been in existence for 10 years and was looking at various properties to acquire and trying to put together a creative package for acquiring those. And, and in fact, we just recently uncovered a 2003 community meeting video uh, where this was being discussed on a smaller property and it didn't come together, but you could hear the founders in their discussion about how to bring the community into a discussion about which lands were worth, uh, were worth uh, acquiring and what the impact would be to the local economy. And, um, and in 2007, the Redwood Forest Foundation was able to acquire the USAL Forest. For those of you who know Northern California, Highway 1 hugs the coastline until it gets heading north from the Bay Area, until it gets to the, the um, Lost Coast. And so the USAL Forest is the beginning part of the Lost Coast. This is where Highway 1 turns inland and uh, leaves the coast and joins Highway 101. And so Highway 101 is our eastern border. Um, and you can see it on this map from Leggett to Piercy. And then Highway 1 uh, is our southern border and it goes through the southern part of the property. And, uh, and this property is um, a total of 50,000 acres, which is 78 square miles. It's approximately 12 miles from north to south and six miles from east to west. Um, it has two major watersheds, the Usal Creek, which drains out into the ocean at Usal Beach, and the South Fork of the Eel River, which is one of the most important salmon habitats in Northern California. 
And uh, in terms of composition, it's 38% tan oak, which is a native hardwood, uh, which is at a much lower percentage when the forest is in balance. But once aggressive harvesting uh, took place, tan oak uh, increased in, in the percentage. And it's also a very low value um, hardwood. So um, not something that uh, we've had much success finding an economic value for. 36% uh, Douglas fir and 26% redwood. We also have a number, uh, several hundred miles of streams, class one, two, and three streams. And, and by the way, uh, also 400 miles of roads and threatened and endangered species, coho and Chinook salmon, steelhead trout, and northern spotted owl. We also have black bear and uh, Roosevelt elk and several other interesting species, wild pigs. So uh, I thought I'd put in a couple pictures to show the property. This is, you get the idea that this is very rugged uh, terrain. It, this is why it's called the Lost Coast. Uh, quite beautiful too. This is looking toward Usall Beach. Uh, this is the South Fork of the Eel River watershed. <clears throat> some of our streams and uh, some of our salmon coming back because of our restoration projects. So how did we purchase this property? Uh, it was a bold adventure at the time. We were able in 2007 to take advantage of a Bank of America green investment portfolio called, um, actually I don't remember what it was called. It was a, a five, uh, $20 billion green investment uh, fund and we were able to acquire a $65 million loan with 100% financing. Uh, part of the strategy was that we were going to acquire a conservation easement as soon as possible after the sale and that that would be a portion of our down payment. But um, this uh, an interesting part of one of the first lessons we learned was that we didn't anticipate, first of all, the 2008 recession. And we also didn't anticipate that there would be potential uh, industry um, opposition to our acquiring funds for a conservation easement. So it took, instead of one year or less to get a conservation easement, it took us four years, uh, during which time we were racking up uh, accrued interest. In 2012, we started our first sustainable harvest. So we had own, owned the property for five years before we did any harvesting. And then in 2016, we were able to register a carbon project with the California Air Resources Board through the cap and trade program. And I do want to make sure that I don't forget to mention that Tom Tuckman uh, from U.S. Forest Capital, who's involved with the um, Sustainable Northwest, is uh, the project manager on our carbon project and has been working with the Redwood Forest Foundation essentially from the beginning. <clears throat> so uh, what kind of revenue that generated? Uh, we originally anticipated getting $30 million from our conservation easement, but in, after a four-year delay, only received $20 million. And that came from Prop 84 Safe Drinking Water Bond funds through the California Wildlife Conservation Board. At the time we uh, closed the conservation easement, we also sold a thousand acres of old growth for uh, redwoods to save the Redwoods League for five million dollars. That's become a preserved part of the uh, California Coastal Trail. Um, and uh, really magnificent at the candelabra trees, if you've heard about those. Uh, we started timber sales, as I said, in 2012. And um, while we generated $553,000 of gross profit in 2019, in terms of the scale of our debt and in the in terms of the scale of our uh, the costs of running the forest, uh, it's really pretty um, marginal. I mean, it's not we're if we add in all of the overhead costs of owning the for owning and managing the forest, um, we operate at a loss on our timber side. And that's where carbon sales has become important. Uh, we're currently generating about $4 million annually from carbon sales. And over the, since 2016, have generated $40 million total um, in carbon offset sales. And I'll talk more about that. Um, I thought you might be interested to know the, what the conservation easement terms are. Uh, first of all, very limited development. On 50,000 acres, we can only develop five 10 acre sites. So a total of 50 acres. No subdivision in perpetuity. 2.9% uh, cap on annual harvest on a five-year rolling basis. So we have a, a cap on how much we can harvest. And we have to transition to uneven age harvesting by the 60th year of ownership. Of course, we wanna do that sooner, but that 
is a is a um, requirement of our conservation easement. Um, we're also required to get um, third party independent certification as a well run forest, which we have done through the Forest Stewardship Council. So I put this graph in just so you could see, you don't need to see the exact numbers, but you get the idea that this is this, the age of our uh, forest. On the left-hand part of the scale is zero to 30 years of age. And on the right-hand is 61 plus age. So you can see kind of in the middle that the bulk of our forest is in the 30 to 60 year um, range. It's a very young forest. And, um, and so, you know, that I'll come back to that at the end, but one of the lessons we've learned is to understand the, the condition of our forest and its ability to be productive. Um, what I'm gonna do now is show you a, a, about a two and a half minute video from our recent annual meeting where my chief forester, Linwood Gill, uh, gives a description of some of the silviculture in the forest. So um, I hope this works and uh, take it away, Linwood. On with our tour. Uh, we're going to look at the USAL Beach uh, Timber Harvest Plan, or THP. Uh, as we scan around the hillside here, you'll, we're starting to get into the area that we logged. You see a few little openings here and there, uh, but most of this was done as a, a single tree selection. And so from a distance, you don't see a whole lot. Uh, we're going to swing around kind of the upper part of the watershed. Uh, Soldier Creek is off to the left. Karen's going to talk about that in a minute. And as we swing back around to uh, this side, or I guess it would be the south side of Usal Creek, uh, we're going to see, you know, some of our activity a little closer. Uh, we have a uh, group selection. You can see a little bit of that. And then as we scroll down, we kind of blend into the single tree selection. And single tree selection, you know, we're looking at taking out individual trees here and there. Uh, here's the top of a, a redwood circle, you know, the sprouting coming off the old stumps. Uh, this is what it looks like from above. We took out two or three trees out of there, leaving the better trees to, to grow for the future. Uh, we're going to scan over a little bit to the group selection straight from above. And most of our group selections are smaller, uh, typically like about an acre, acre and a half in size. This one is just at about an acre. And even within the group, we like to leave trees that will be future legacy trees or potential seed trees now. And on our groups, uh, we're going up along the side of the group right now. Uh, we like to find places that already have uh, what we consider kind of advanced regeneration. Uh, here's a redwood sprout, uh, probably like about 10, 10 years old, 15 years old. Uh, so by allowing more light into where we already have some regeneration started, it really kind of jump starts that next age class. And that's what we're really looking for. We're looking for a multi-age forest out there and a lot of this is, you know, been clear cut in the past, and it is typically all the same age. Um, here is our, you know, our single tree selection area. And one of the first things we look for is, you know, which trees do we want to leave? Which are the trees that we want to grow, uh, you know, excuse me, in our, you know, to our largest diameter classes available to us? And again, here's where's a redwood sprouting off of an old, old growth stump. Uh, you can look down on the ground and you can see, I think, two, uh, two of the smaller trees that we removed. So we're kind of reducing that competition. And redwood, a lot of times it's for, you know, it's for water. Uh, sometimes it's for light if we take out one of the more uh, co-dominant trees. Okay, I hope that was useful. Uh, if you're interested, that's about uh, two and a half minutes of a 15 minute video that's on our website as part of our 2020 uh, annual meeting, we also have about a 15 minute video of our restoration projects, which I didn't go into here, but um, quite interesting if you're interested. And I'll give you our website address at the end. So I wanna talk briefly about the carbon project and the importance that has to our success. Uh, first of all, uh, California has a cap and trade law that was put in place in 2006. And we registered our project with the California Resource Air, Air Resources Board in 2016 with Tom Tuckman's help. Uh, to date, we've registered 5 million metric tons of carbon. And um, in 2016, the Climate Action Reserve, which is one of the registering agencies, listed us as their project developer of the year because at the time we had the largest forest carbon offset project in the United States. Uh, we still have the largest uh, project in California, but I think we're eighth largest in the United States now. 
And the impact that the carbon sales had on our timber harvest plans is it really, you know, we, we are a working forest. So we want to continue to produce wood products and jobs for the local community. And we want to support the infrastructure of mills and uh, all of the forestry industry. But at the same time, we want to do it on a sustainable ba basis where we're balancing timber harvest with carbon sales and uh, protecting our forests into the future, investing into the future. So first of all, we uh, are selling Douglas fir and redwood. And the volumes uh, starting in 2012, we did 1.2 million board feet. That increased every year until 2015 when we were at 7.1 million board feet. And uh, my belief, and I think my foresters would su support this, was that it was increasing at an unsustainable rate. And so the carbon project really allowed us to balance that in 2000, by 2018, we were able to go back down to about 2.1 million board feet. And in 2019, 1.1 million board feet. And right now we're projecting maintaining at that level for the next several years in order to let our trees grow. So the successes that we've had over the years, first of all, nonprofit community ownership in 2007. So we were able to get control of, the, of a large local resource. And we also have done $5 million worth of restoration projects since that time, restoring um, our watersheds. I mentioned that we have two major watersheds and we have 10 sub watersheds. So we've been going one by one, uh, decommissioning roads, uh, regrading the streams, putting in large wood structures and um, you know, trying to essentially stop the siltation and, and, uh, and allow the um, fish to come back. And then 2011, permanent protection via the conservation easement. 2012, providing local timber jobs and supporting local mills and infrastructure. <clears throat> 2015, Forest Stewardship Council certification as a well-managed forest. And then we also, in 2000, the end of 2015, uh, took management in-house. When we purchased the property in 2007, we um, inherited the uh, previous forest manager, uh, many of you know, uh, Campbell, Campbell uh, Global, at the time, Campbell Timberland Management. And they did a great job of managing that forest for us, but we really wanted to take the management in-house and hire our own management team, which we did at the end of 2015. And 2016, carbon register and uh, sale, and then ongoing community jobs and support. <clears throat> The uh, economic impacts, I just wanted to put in a slide to show uh, how we quantify this. We believe that we create 153 direct jobs through our own staff. Actually, our own staff is only eight, but we also have uh, a series of contractors who work for us and uh, uh, doing everything from forest related jobs to uh, geology and biology surveys and uh, road maintenance and vegetation management, security, uh, everything that goes into managing a large forest. We put $3 million annually into the local economy. And we believe that's an equal indirect impact uh, in number of jobs and also economic benefit. The challenges, uh, which I'll uh, go into a little bit is, uh, first of all, we have a large debt still. And I'll talk about that. Uh, and one of the things that is Complicating that is that carbon credits, the, the California's cap and trade law is currently due to sunset in 2030, and it's not clear whether it's going to be extended, and we really uh, can't plan on that. So that means that at some point after 2030, our forest is going to have to take over the service of our debt, and we have to understand what the um, productivity potential of our forest is. And, and we've also been in negotiations with our lender, Bank of America, to refinance our debt because of the large accrued interest that we had in the early years when we weren't harvesting and we, were, uh, we hadn't received our conservation easement. And, and we believe that our lender will um, be cooperative with that. So that's an important part of our debt service. Um, and I'll come back to the forest productivity in a minute. Another challenge for us is funding the nonprofit programs because all of the income that we generate from timber harvest and carbon is restricted for debt payments. So it doesn't do anything to support our nonprofit programs like reforestation and restoration. Well, the re reforestation is covered as part of our forestry expense, but some of our restoration projects, our trail building, 
our educational programs, academic research, we hope to have at some point, um, and future land acquisitions are, um, you know, we have to raise money mostly through charitable donations for that. Uh, and it might, you might be interested to know that we're currently in the process of purchasing a 95 acre in holding within our forest that's been in the same family ownership for 100 years. And um, we hope to convert that into uh, some kind of a public use, including um, a retreat center or an academic research station or even a field office. So um, all of that requires nonprofit fundraising separate from our forestry operation. And then community engagement. We, we uh, are currently undergoing a strategic plan. And one of the things that we are trying to get clear on is who is our community and what is their role in our governance. And uh, currently we have 11 board members, I'm sorry, 10 board members, all from the Redwood region. We also have about 27 community advisory members who are non-voting board members, but they are invited to all of our meetings. And then we have a, a large, uh, support base of people who come to our annual meeting and take part in our uh, activities but aren't part of our governance. Um, so um, I'm sure many of you have similar issues with how to in, um, engage the community and I'd be glad to talk about some of the challenges of that but it's something that we're, we're trying to nuance and understand at this time what's the best community engagement model. So I just wanted to show this uh, one of our recent uh, community activities was to have our, our first our, our first and second mountain biking race and we were just about to have our third annual it's called the USAL Hopper and uh, we had 200 participants last year and it also raised some money uh, this year unfortunately because of COVID we weren't able to have it but it's one of the ways managed ways we've been um, getting the community out into our forest and uh, and of course getting people into the forest is one of the primary ways to generate community support. So we're always looking for managed ways to uh, engage our community. Um, a couple more words I just wanted to say before we open up for questions, but um, I've been asked about what were uh, some of the lessons we learned. Um, and, and I think the, the best way I could say that is right now uh, in our strategic plan, we really, uh, we, we had always understood that at some point we were gonna have to, Timber was gonna have to take over the payment of our debt. Um, but we recently commissioned a report by an independent uh, forest management company, BBW and Associates of Arcata, California, to really look at our timber in inventories and tell us what is the forecast for the next 40 years for the timber. And what they came back and told us was that only about one third of our property is currently economically viable in terms of generating revenue. And about two thirds of the property um, is marginally economically valuable depending on decisions we make about how to manage it. And so one of the lessons we learned was to make sure that you're clear from the beginning what the condition of the forest is and what, it's, what it would take for it to become productive, including the costs of becoming productive. And um, so that, I think that's one of the things that we learned that we, we think that we uh, potentially overvalued the amount of timber and its ability to be productive at the beginning. And, uh, and I also wanted to mention the fact that tan oak I mentioned is a um, hardwood that has low value, but one of the benefits of our carbon project is that tan oak counts towards our carbon. And so we've been able to monetize carbon, uh, uh, hardwood, um, tan oak hardwood through the uh, carbon project. So um, I could go on and on, but I think I'll stop there and uh, see if there are any questions. And this is my contact information. Uh, Linwood Gill is my chief forester and our website is uh, rffi.org. Thanks so much, Mark, that was great. Um, and we do have many questions coming in for you. Um, and since you just presented, maybe we'll, we'll stay, stay with you for a few minutes and then we'll also jump back to um, both of the Ben's. Um, I'll just read some of the questions that we've collected here. Uh, one from John Purcell, if you are harvesting 1.1 million board feet um, of 50,000 acres each year, uh, how much timber are you growing annually? So you could just talk about. Uh, well, we estimate the growth rate to be between three and 4%. And that 1.1 million board feet usually comes off of between two and 300 acres. So, um, you know, we have done projections over the next 
uh, 10 years for how we're going to lay out our timber harvest plans. And we, um, but, but most of them are in the two to 300 acre size. Um, I don't, I think that answers the question. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, another couple of questions I think that are related. One is um, if local industry is coming on board, are you finding that the timber industry is transitioning um, you know, into your restoration and harvesting work if you're finding that there's more support? And on a related note, could you also speak to the relationship you have with contractors in your area and how you're learning together uh, related to selective logging practices um, and sustainable harvest or if, if, that was, if that expertise was already in place before you started working with them? Um, we believe that we have some impact on forestry in general. Well, first of all, I want to mention that our conservation easement was originally held by the nonprofit conservation fund. And after about three years, it was transferred to the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. So our regulatory agency, Cal Fire, is our easement holder. And we believe that, at least we hope that uh, by having a close relationship with CAL FIRE and having them monitor our easement every year, that we're modeling some of the future forest practice rules in California and that we're having an impact in that way. We also think we, we're members of the Forest Stewardship Council. And uh, so we're hoping that by talking about our model on the national and international level, it will also impact forestry in that way. In terms of our local contractors, I mean, I think when we first started working with them, they were kind of scratching their head trying to figure out what we were up to. And one of the, I think one of my favorite stories is that we did a biochar demonstration project in 2015 where we were harvesting tan oak and chipping it and putting it into a, a conversion machine that was making it into a, a carbon rich soil amendment product. And it wasn't economical, but, but the foresters had a really hard time understanding why we were asking them to cut and deck tan oak, which is usually used for firewood. And, and it was, it's kind of an example of how we were doing different things uh, that, uh, that they didn't anticipate and understand. But I think over time, they've seen that not only are we doing uh, some really innovative forestry practices, but we're also continuing to um, employ them and, uh, and do it in, um, in, in ways where they, they have work all year round. So you know, we want, we would, we eventually will do it on a larger scale. Right now we're keeping the timber harvest kind of managed at a lower, lower level, but over time it will increase. And, and I think, um, you know, there are very few mills left in our area. There used to be, um, you know, probably a hundred mills in the area where now there's three or four mills. So, um, you know, it's important to support that infrastructure if we're gonna be a working forest. Absolutely. Um, did you want to maybe touch on also the the perception of the timber industry and if you've gained any traction there over time? Well, um, I guess the way I would answer that is to say that we, as a as a large forest carbon landowner, we helped start and are a member of the eleven member California Forest Carbon Offset Coalition, which does lobbying in California. Actually. Uh, cap and trade and carbon are under attack in California, either from both sides. Uh, you know, uh, environmentalists quite often feel like it's not real uh, sequestration or not additional um, carbon sequestration. And, and also environmental justice groups, many think that it doesn't do anything to help uh, poor communities in uh, who are affected by particulates and other pollution. So there's a, a need to educate uh, legislators and the public about carbon offsets. And so we're in a coalition that includes nonprofits, but it also includes industry members and it includes tribes. And uh, it's, it's, a pr it's pretty much a, a, a big tent of large forest carbon landowners. And so I think in that way, we have an influence on industry because they're getting to know us and seeing the, the uh, kind of forestry we're practicing. And while I think they're skeptical too about our ability to make this a long-term economic venture, um, we've gone a lot further than a lot of people predicted we would. And, and I think it's partly because we have really smart, innovative people who are willing to uh, you know, make some bold, take some bold risks uh, in the interest of, of you know, acquiring large community forests. Great, I think that 
um, might be a nice lead and also to a question from Seth, Seth Zuckerman um, about the annual debt service on the property. Um, can you talk about that number as well as the fixed overhead costs like property taxes and insurance with it? Um, let's see <laughs> where to start. Um, the, uh, our, our, our debt is kind of complicated, so it's uh, hard to explain in simple terms, but uh, part of it was secured by the property and part of it was not secured. And so the part that is secured by the property is actually almost paid off. We, uh, because of our carbon offsets, we've been able to pay down the secured part of the debt. And that would leave a, a large unsecured debt that is the part that's negotiable with the bank. And so um, on an annual basis, we're paying, I believe, about $2 million toward the debt service. Um, and um, um, I'm not sure what else to say about that. Um, what was the rest of the question? Um, I think just related to the, the fixed costs that are associated with management, as well as the debt itself, um, overhead costs, property taxes, insurance. Um, well, I can, I'd be glad to have a, a more detailed conversation offline, but it, it, uh, we, our overhead costs, I think it costs us about $2 million a year to run our forest. And, um, you know, we have an operating reserve that we've established with Bank of America that allows us to have funds to operate. But as I said, we, we've made the strategic decision. We do this in our budget process every year. We made the strategic decision to keep our timber harvests at a fairly low level because we have the opportunity to offset that with uh, carbon income and, uh, and balance that. Um, obviously, if we didn't have carbon offsets, we'd, be, we'd have to hammer the property right now. Um, and I'm not sure even then that we'd be able to pay the debt. Um, so it's it, but but the, it costs us about $2 million a year to operate the forest, and that includes the insurance and the um, property taxes, and it also includes security and all the other maintenance stuff that goes with having a large forest property. Great. Thank you. I will um, connect you and Seth offline if, if he's got yeah. more detailed questions for you. Sure. Um, and I'll just ask you one more question, and then we'll, we'll jump to the bends. Um, this is also from John Purcell. With your endangered species on the property, have you been able to draw funding from the Land and Water Conservation Fund at any point? We have not. And uh, um, most of our um, restoration money has come through the California Department of Natural Resources and, or, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Fish and Wildlife S Service, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And um, we um, haven't, you know, we have, uh, we're regulated by uh, the uh, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife in terms of our forestry around the Northern Spotted Owl activity sites. By the way, we have 20 Northern Spotted Owl activity sites on the property. So, um, and, and we're starting to have an infusion of barred owls as well. So it's, uh, it's a dynamic um, landscape. Thanks so much, Mark. Really appreciate your presentation and, and continue to be so impressed by your operation. The more that I learn about the USAL forest, it's really... Um, can, can I make a short comment? Uh, Richard sure, Ginger is one of our, board, was a Ruffy board member. Oh, great. Sure. Go ahead, Richard. Uh, I just think Ruffy, the excitement of Ruffy, Ruffy is a model for what forests need to go toward, uh, given the context of these fires and the uh, on the North Coast, uh, all all over the North Coast, California, Oregon, and Washington, because a uh, Ruffy is aiming to actually have larger trees that are part of what the healthy forest is supposed to be. And while a lot of this work that's going on in the forest is is not providing any standards for these larger trees, which are fire resistant and high quality, and and Ruffy is is as a should be a well known as a model for how forests should be treated moving forward to deal with fire, uh, with carbon, uh, with water, and with habitat. Uh, Kiel, before you transition, I, uh, I had uh, two other quick things I just wanted to say that I want to make sure that I got in, and, and this is related to the topic. The um, First of all, we have looked at the California Clean Water State Revolving Funds as a way to refinance our debt once we um, are uh, in the process of renegotiating with Bank of America. And um, while that fund doesn't currently do refinancing as opposed to acquisition funds, 
Uh, we're hoping that that might change. And we also are have talked about, uh, as I know many of you have, about finding ways to monetize ecosystem services. And part of the reason that I wanted to get involved with this meeting and, and coalition with you and with a broader set of uh, community forests uh, nationwide is because we want to uh, lobby for those services to, um, you know, to be funded uh, on a state and national level um, as they are not now. So um, all of that is is part of why we uh, want to work with you and with other community forests um, to try to to uh, get policy change so that it works more in our favor. Thanks so much, Mark. We would be excited to work with you on that. And I think the more voices we have, the you know more successful we're likely to be. I also think with the work we're doing in Oregon and Washington on clean water SRF, it's interesting to note that if we're if we're going to make the effort to change it, that we should consider expanding to refinancing. That's an interesting case. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much. And maybe that's a good segue also into having uh, Ben Donatel and uh, Ben Rothbus rejoin us by video if they want to jump back on. Um, Hi guys, there are some questions for you. Um, I'll start with some for you. And Ben, I'm sorry, is it Donatelle or Donatelli? I now, I now know that I could be saying it wrong either way. Uh, Donatelli is well. right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, well, so one of the first questions we had for you was um, if the fee title has to go to the eligible applicant or if the title could go to, for example, a land trust with the eligible applicant holding the easement. And that's from Ben Pittenger. Yeah, thanks for the question, Ben. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say that I left nonprofits off of my slide um, at, in the list of eligible applicants. So yeah, most definitely nonprofits are eligible to apply in this program and be the long-term land holders. Um, so sorry for that confusion. No problem. Thanks for the clarification. And actually, he had the same question for you, um, Ben Dare Rothfuss. If um, when we're looking at clean water SRF funds, do, would the title go to eligible applicant or a trust with the agency holding a conservation easement? Yeah. So, um, a little bit of the background on the state revolving funds. The uh, state implementing agency is the Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, the state implementing agency is dispersing Environmental Protection Agency federal funds, but the state revolving fund program itself also has um, a repayment stream. And so the state implementing agency is in essence managing a pool of capital that is both federal and state. And in order to disperse federal capital, it needs to um, be meeting those requirements of the program. So the clean water program is all about preventing pollution and specifically preventing non-point source pollution. That's why the majority of projects that are funded through the program are infrastructure projects for wastewater treatment plants, uh, for pumps, uh, for irrigation districts um, and other systems. Uh, the recipients, the ones that are actually receiving funds are typically municipalities or service districts that have in their charter or in their incorporation documents somewhere um, that they're organized for the purposes of delivering water and treating wastewater. Um, that gets a little bit tricky. I don't know any nonprofits that are organized for the purposes of preventing non-point source pollution. Um, in Oregon, and as is the case with the Arch Cape Water District and the Arch Cape Sanitary District, uh, special districts are sometimes organized around service delivery for their constituents and their rate payers. Um, so that's sort of a long-winded way of saying the applicant and the recipient of the funds needs to be um, a municipality or a service district with, uh, that's organized for the purposes of non-point source pollution control. And then on top of that, um, the, the municipality or the recipient could then take those funds and pay a nonprofit to procure services or, or complete a project. Um, so it would then up, be up to the town uh, to decide how to spend the money on the project. Um, something we've been finding in reviewing many years of intended use plans um, is that the, the funding typically goes to projects uh, where there's some 
uh, permit issue or uh, total maximum daily load TMDL issue in a basin or a stream. Um, so not all of these upgrades are happening because uh, gra of grassroots organizing and, and interest are typically happening because of some sort of DEQ enforcement action. Um, uh, thank you. Um, Gabe is pointing out in the chat that tribes are eligible borrowers. Uh, tribes have a lot more flexibility in what they can use the funds for. Um, and in fact, uh, the Nisqually Land Trust and Nisqually River Foundation have a partnership with the tribe uh, where they've successfully received a state revolving fund allocation in Washington for the purposes of land acquisition. Um, so I'll stop there that, uh, and, and pass it off. Thanks, Ben. Um, and I'm just going to ask one more question, and I think it's a good one. I know there are a couple more detailed questions that I think I can pass on to Ben, um, ben Donatelli for uh, follow up by email. So I haven't lost your question. If it's not here in the discussion today, I just want to um, you know, I think we scheduled about an hour and I know we're a little bit over. So, um, but I think this is a great question to end on from Gabe Epperson. Um, thinking about the recent applications for the community forest program, um, can you speak to the balance of conservation versus economic development versus community access in the projects? Do you feel like these are good community forest projects rather than conservation projects? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and to, to start to answer that, um, one of the stipulation in any project that our agency funds is we put a deed of right, which is essentially our conservation easement on that, on that acquisition. Um, one of the principal things that that deed of right provides is a public access right to the citizens and their residents in the state of Washington um, and public access generally. Um, so in terms of the projects um, that were submitted, I think it's a good balance of um, trying to achieve that economic development and, and forestry, forest health. Um, most of the projects that I think you'll see ranked higher on the list are either projects that are already adding to already established community forests and um, community forests that have sort of been in the establishing community forests that have already kind of been in the works for a number of years. Um, so I think uh, there's a good balance of um, that sort of economic development, sustainable timber harvest and public access. Uh, there were a couple of projects that I think are more that sort of traditional forest conservation type um, mindset. And that was something that we wrestled with in the, um, in the advisory committee uh, quite a lot actually was, um, you know, do we impose some sort of, you know, harvest requirement or, um, you know, things like that. Um, and ultimately came to the conclusion that it's really up to the communities to decide how they want to manage these forests. Um, and so that hence the requirement for the forest management plan um, being as one of the deliverables of the project. And so um, there's sort of the hook there to really get the community involved and engaged um, in how they want to manage this forest. Thanks, Ben. I think. Um... I think we've lost Susan Turnley, but I believe she was on this presentation earlier. I wonder if we should also, you know, encourage her as she's thinking about the typology for different community forests um, and, and a spectrum that this would be a great question for her to try to address or incorporate in how she develops that. Um, if folks saw the Keystone uh, or Keynote <laughs> um, presentation yesterday morning, that was um, sort of threaded through the topic. And I know it's one we continue to struggle with or explore not struggle, explore with um, the coalition generally. Well, thank you all so very much. Uh, really great presentation. And um, I think we're going to look at the recording and see how it goes. Uh, but hopefully we'll be posting that shortly along with the materials from um, all of our presenters. Thanks everyone for being here. And uh, we'll take a little break and we have our last presentation of the day in just about half an hour. See you soon. <laughs>